Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Frank Connor. I am the chair of the psychology department here at Grand Rapids Community College. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today, uh, Dr. Julia Carey. Uh, Dr. Carey is an assistant professor in the psychology department at GRCC. Uh, Dr. Carey did her undergraduate work at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and that did her doctoral work at the University of Colorado Boulder. Her area of interest and expertise is around the topics of uh, stress and neurology and such as um, she's going to be sharing with us in her presentation today. Dr. Carey. Hi, thank you. Um, so I am going to share my screen. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Um, it looks like we have a bunch of people, so I'm super excited. Um, but I would love to be able to do this in person. Um, and unfortunately we can't. So, um, in lieu of being able to ask questions, sort of raising your hand, um, we do have a Q and a, uh, box forum. So if you do have questions as I go, um, particularly if anything is not clear, I will be talking about some, you know, cell biology concepts. So if things aren't clear, um, or if you have any questions as I go, please feel free to ask questions. Um, I would love to answer as we go. Okay. So, um, so it's been a hard year. We're actually uh, right around the one year mark from when kind of crap hit the fan last year. And, um, uh, oh, we already have a question. Yes, the, this lecture is being recorded uh, right now. So, okay. Um, so yes, this has been a really hard year. Um, you know, who knew that toilet paper would be so important for everyone. Um, and we have been impacted worldwide. Right? Like there's, you know, jokes that 2020 was a, a dumpster fire and, you know, we're only a couple of months into 2021 and we're still dealing with all of that. Um, and I think that a lot of people have really sort of turned into this nocturnal gremlin that's pictured here. Um, and what we're seeing is that COVID really has sort of impacted us all, right? Even in absence of ever getting infected with COVID. Um, we're all being impacted by this. So it's, it's sort of impacting us in two sort of fundamentally different ways. We have these indirect effects of COVID, which is sort of adding to our everyday stress. Um, and this is kind of that I'm sick of COVID, right? Like I'm sick of dealing with this. I'm sick of how this has impacted my life. Um, and this has been, you know, social factors, economic factors, and factors of our health that it's not related to an actual COVID infection. And then we have more of the direct effects of, of a COVID infection. And this is particularly for infection and death rates. So, you know, um, the other side is like, I'm sick with COVID. And what we see is that, um, you know, for some people who actually do get exposed to and um, infected with COVID, some people recover and they sort of go on um, and some people don't, right? And, and for some people, this actually does lead to death. So the first part of my talk today is really going to be understanding how this process works. How um, does a viral infection incur? Uh, excuse me, a viral infection occur? How does our body respond? Um, and, and what are we seeing in terms of the data is who is most vulnerable and who is this impacting the most? What we also see is that certain people are dying at higher rates and we are able to actually link this back um, to certain populations who are actually disproportionately experiencing this sort of indirect everyday stress effects of COVID. So the second part of my talk is really gonna be kind of understanding how COVID has sort of stressed us all out, um, why certain people are, are experiencing that disproportionately more. And we know that stress really does interact with um, our immune systems and it, it changes how we respond to infection. And so the second part of my talk is really gonna be focused on, on understanding how stress might actually impact or influence these elevated death rates we see in certain populations. And then the third part um, of the talk is really gonna be focused on the COVID vaccine 
um, moving forward, this is something that, that's very hopeful. And um, so I'm gonna talk about that, um, particularly with are the hardest hit populations actually getting the COVID vaccine and why or why not might that be the case? Um, I'll go through how this vaccine works. It's actually a little bit different from um, typical vaccines that we're, uh, we've been exposed to before. And then um, go through uh, some common vaccine myths um, and helping to dispel some of those myths. Okay, so uh, diving in part one, the infection of COVID. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of times we, um, you know, we've been dealing with this for a long time, a year now at this point. And um, at, at a certain point, we sort of become desensitized to uh, what this really is doing and how bad it really, really was and shocking it really was for us on initially. And um, what we see is that, uh, you know, initially we were, we were traumatized with how quickly people were getting sick and dying. And I think that this quote really sort of pulls that back and, and identifies that, um, you know, frontline workers, particularly in the healthcare fields, were shocked at how quickly people were coming in and slipping um, out into death. And um, so I think that, you know, really sort of highlighting that, that this is a, a, a death uh, topic, right? That that we need to remember that people are, are are dying from this. And what we see, according to the World Health Organization, is that worldwide we're at about two and a half million deaths. And that's a lot. Um, and I, heard, I read that just yesterday, just yesterday, uh, the United States surpassed half a million. Like, yay, um, this is not something that we should be proud of, right? But this is, that's a big milestone. Um, and even here in Michigan, we are at about 15,000 deaths right now. And I think sometimes we really, for, not forget, but we, it, we have a hard time, our brains have a hard time uh, really processing how much that actually is. Um, so for instance, if we were to sit here in silence for one second for each of the 15,000 deaths, just in Michigan, uh, we would be sitting here for over four and a half hours, right? So when you put it in those terms, it's, it's really easy to recognize that that is a lot of people. Um, and what we're seeing is that these hardest hit populations are elderly, sick or people with pre-existing health conditions. And we're seeing this huge disproportional rate of deaths in racial and ethnic populations. So going into sort of how do we understand what's happening, this is all happening from a tiny little virus. So what is this virus all about? So COVID-19 um, actually stands for coronavirus disease and 2019 is the year that it was first identified. Um, and it's actually caused by a, vi a virus called SARS-CoV-2. Um, so during this talk, I'll just sort of refer to it generally as COVID, um, but the actual virus is titled SARS-CoV-2. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And this is the second version of a coronavirus we know of that causes SARS. Um, but coronaviruses in general are not new. Anytime you get a common cold, it's usually some form of a coronavirus. Um, and, a, and a lot of people have sort of compared this to the flu, and we know that it is not at all like the flu. The flu is actually caused by a separate type of virus called the influenza virus. And even though we see that symptomology is you know, fairly similar, um, with COVID, it is new. So we have no sort of baseline level of herd immunity. Um, it's more infectious and spreads quicker. And we see that severe case rates are actually much higher than, than we ever see with the flu. So what happens is that um, SARS-CoV-2 um, actually has these little proteins on the outside of it called spike proteins. And these spiked proteins bind to a certain receptor on our human cells. So this blue area is sort of a, a human cell. Um, and these ACE2 receptors um, are just sort of naturally occurring on our cells. And the spike proteins bind to and kind of trick these ACE2 receptors into letting the virus into the cell. And so when a, a virus actually enters the cell, it has one job, which is to uh, replicate more virus. Um, so what happens is that the viruses, and this is sort of like a prototypical viral infection, um, viruses kind of trick our cells into becoming little viral manufacturing facilities. 
And um, so that the viruses sort of hijack that process and use up all of the resources of the cell to uh, synthesize and assemble new viral um, units. And those are sort of spit out and released, leaving kind of a dead husk of a human cell behind. And then each of those individual um, you know, viruses then go on to infect new cells. So um, this is sort of a, a typical immune response. And I know that, you know, on first, it, first looking at this, this might feel a little overwhelming. So don't worry, I'll walk you through what happens. Um, so in our bodies, we have these resting innate immune cells and these, these little green sunbursts are, are used to sort of illustrate that. And um, these uh, innate immune cells sort of at rest have these long projections and they actually really do sort of extend them and reach out and sample the environment. And if one of these cells happens to uh, sample or encounter a virus, and this isn't COVID, this is just sort of any virus, they all sort of, you know, many of them look similar that this cell actually changes and becomes activated. So this sort of green sunburst changes into more of this like green flower shape. And they actually do sort of pull in um, and become more enclosed. They're not sampling the environment anymore. They are now um, an activated cell that has sort of different functions. So they do two main things. I can't, hold on. There's my cursor. Okay, so there's two main things that happen. One is that the they sort of sound an alarm and become very activated um, and, and release the cytokine alarm, um, which is basically inflammation. So it, it um, is basically like a fire alarm going off, right? like loud sirens. It's recruiting a lot of other cells to the area to help with um, to help combat the infection or the emergency. Um, and it's really kind of a messy, loud uh, response. And also these cells will sort of digest and take a little tiny piece of that virus um, and present it to an acquired immune cell so that those acquired immune cells can, can learn this specific virus and manufacture antibodies to that specific virus. So if we ever encounter um, that particular virus, again, we have sort of an innate learned acquired uh, reaction or response for it. Um, so what, what you see is that really do have sort of two types of immune responses. This, uh, this first sort of innate immunity is what we typically think of when we think of inflammation, right? So it's very immediate. Um, it doesn't require any prior exposure, right? These cells are actually trained um, to respond to just classes of pathogens. Um, it's kind of loud and messy and obnoxious, um, and it, it really sort of kills the pathogen, um, but it also sort of kills healthy cells. So there's a lot of kind of residual damage. And this innate immune response sort of triggers the acquired immune response that comes later, right? So though the acquired immune response is more antibodies. Um, so when you think antibodies, you're actually just thinking about this sort of second phase or the second wave. This is delayed. It takes a couple days to actually um, in initiate that process, but it's very targeted, specific, and efficient. It's also really clean. Um, so if we think of innate immunity as like a bomb that gets dropped, excuse me, you know, if you drop a bunch of bombs, you're going to be destroying sort of all everything in the area, the pathogen included, whereas acquired immunity is much more like a, a sharpshooter, right? Very targeted and, and specific. And then another great uh, response to that is that antibodies then provide us with long-term protection. So um, what we have here is kind of a um, kind of a, a typical viral infection. And now this isn't sort of how it works for all viruses. Different viruses target us in different ways. Um, but if you want to think about maybe you getting the common cold, which is, you know, again, another type of coronavirus, um, this is what you might see. You have at some point an exposure um, that, you know, virus will get into your system. Um, the, those viruses will be <clears throat> to replicate using your own cells. Um, and you will level, have levels of, you know, virus rise in your system. Um, at some point, you will start to experience symptoms from that. 
And uh, typically with COVID, we see some sort of hallmark symptoms like a fever, a cough, shortness of breath and loss of taste and smell, which is kind of a, a unique symptom for COVID. But what we see is that, um, you know, we, we, I feel like it's a common misconception that the symptoms are associated with the actual peak of the virus itself in your body. Um, but the virus is not what's causing the symptoms. What's causing your symptoms is actually that first innate immune response signal that you're getting. Um, and so there's sort of like two things to note about that. One is that your symptoms are not caused by the virus, but by this innate immune response. And two, when this is happening, um, it naturally, um, that this is actually kind of a good response, right? These symptoms are actually beneficial. And what's happening is even though, you know, bombs are getting dropped, um, the, the, the responses that we're seeing actually do help clear um, or kill the pathogen. So for instance, um, some bacteria don't, can't really thrive at temperatures above our basal body temperature. Um, and so a uh, a, a fever reaction is actually an adaptive response to um, inhibit the replication of, of particular pathogens. Um, we might think of um, a cough or a runny nose as, as actual ways that you can sort of flush out um, parts of that infection. Same with if you have like a, a digestive issue, like running to the bathroom, your body is literally trying to flush that out. So while they're very unpleasant, these symptoms, um, they, they actually can be quite adaptive and helpful for us. Um, the second thing that the innate immune response does, in, in addition to, to kind of creating those symptoms that we experience, is it initiates that sort of second acquired immune response that leads to the antibody production. And what we see is that um, with a, you know, a typical viral infection where we recover, we have um, symptoms are mild. Sometimes they're lacking altogether, right? If we don't actually really need that. Um, viral infection is sort of efficiently cleared and we have long lasting resistance. And this is actually a really great thing because it actually makes us stronger after. Um, but what we see with COVID is that some people are kind of long haulers. Um, where they're having increased severity of the sickness overall, increased duration of the infection. So for some, we see that this process actually stops because um, some people uh, actually die from this, right? And, and so we're seeing um, with COVID that there are increased death rates for certain populations. And as I sort of alluded to, and we'll talk about more, that this is specifically for elderly populations, um, people with underlying health conditions, and particularly for Black, Hispanic, and Indigenous populations. <clears throat> And we see this play out in the data. This is, um, this is data from the uh, CDC or the Center for Disease Control. Um, this was pulled uh, earlier this, this month. So it's you know, still fairly recent and up to date. Um, and what we see is that about 81% 80, um, of the people who are dying from COVID are actually uh, 65 and older. So this confirms you know, advanced age is um, a uh, a group most impacted. Um, and while this data is uh, really focused on the types of comorbid conditions, what I actually want you to look at here is that 94% of all COVID related death certificates list a comorbid or a pre existing condition as sort of a secondary cause. So what we're seeing is that um, advanced, people who have advanced age and people who have some other sort of sickness occurring are, are definitely more susceptible to COVID infection. And I think that this is a little bit um, intuitive, right? Like we might understand that older people are, are less robust and um, that sick people are sort of already struggling with a disease or infection. And so it's understandable but that these groups would be more vulnerable to a severe infection like COVID. But what we're seeing is that there's also this huge disparity in um, the death rates, um, particularly like infection rates, hospitalization rates, and death rates um, for certain racial and ethnic groups, particularly for um, indigenous populations, uh, black populations, and Hispanic populations. 
And this is like a little less intuitive, right? There's not a natural sort of, oh, well, that makes sense because of explanation for this. Um, but when we look at what the CDC is actually saying here, and I've highlighted it for you, race and ethnicity are risk markers for other underlying conditions that affect health, including socioeconomic status, access to healthcare, and exposure to the virus related to occupation. They're more likely to be frontline, essential, and critical infrastructure workers. So what this is saying is that the economic situation that unfortunately um, a lot of, of, um, of minority, racial minority um, populations are finding themselves in is that they are actually more likely to experience those pre, uh, pre-existing or comorbid conditions. And so that's kind of setting them up to be more vulnerable as a result. So again, as we're seeing, we have certain people who just aren't able to recover, right? We have death rates are, are sort of increased for certain populations. And again, what we're seeing is that those populations also tend to be the same people who are experiencing elevated just everyday stress as a result of how COVID has impacted all of our lives fundamentally. So now the second part of the talk is really going to going to talk about and sort of describe how this process all works together. Um, okay, so I, I wanted to kind of start each, each section with a quote, and I sort of just generally put unprecedented times because I felt like everyone said this early on in 2020 when um, this was really starting, um, because we all do fundamentally feel this, right? We, we all know that COVID has impacted us, right? That's not, there's not a question there. Um, but to really understand exactly what's going on, we see that there are sort of three fundamental ways that this is doing um, or sort of impacting us. That's um, social connection, um, economic impact, and physical health and mental health. Um, and so when I'm talking about social connection, um, I'm talking about, you know, redu reduced ability to care for loved ones, um, particularly for people who are sick or dying, um, and increased loss of loved ones. So for certain populations that are experiencing elevated death rates, the other people who are, are surviving are Im impacted greater because they have more people in their lives dying. We also see um, a huge economic impact. There's the biggest drop in unemployment rates that we've seen in the past 40 years. In fact, it's three times um, bigger than anything we've ever experienced in the past 70 years. Right? So this is a huge economic impact. And again, certain groups are hardest hit, right? Low wage, non-essential workers, in particular racial and ethnic populations. Um, for instance, the uh, Michigan Task Force on Racial Disparities has shown that um, African-American owned businesses businesses here in Michigan received the least amount of money from the federal PPP loan program. All right, so certain people are, are feeling that economic pinch harder. And then we also have this physical and mental health impact. And, um, you know, again, this is kind of not related to a COVID infection. This is like the indirect effects of COVID is impacting our lives. Um, so we have a dramatic increase in substance abuse and suicidal ideation. Um, and again, certain populations are harder hit with that. Young adults, um, people who are part of the essential workers force. So, um, you know, people who might not be uh, experiencing the economic strain quite as much because they're continuing to work, but yet they're, you know, burnt out um, and they're on the front line and they're seeing the trauma firsthand. And then again, also certain racial and ethnic minority populations are getting getting hardest hit with this third thing too. So when we're kind of understanding or trying to understand how stress or how the, the stress of COVID is, is impacting us, we have to sort of get down to basics and really just understand what stress is. So stress on a, on a very basic level is any challenge to our system. It's anything that makes us have to um, accommodate or change in any way. Um, and it can be very small, like eating a meal or going for a run, right? Like that, that makes your body have to change a little bit to accommodate what you're doing. Um, and little stressors like that are, are actually pretty good and adaptive and, and improve your resilience to stress in the future. And that's called eustress or, you know, e eu stress, um, which might be a term that's new for some people. Um, whereas 
if stress is really uh, intense or long term, um, we that tends to kind of transition us more into this distress category that's pretty bad and not super healthy for us. And we see that there are three main factors that influence whether or not uh, a stressful experience is going to take more of this sort of eustress, adaptive, good form, or much more of this sort of uh, distress, um, maladaptive, or, or harmful form. And those three things are duration, intensity, and control. And I'm actually going to go through each of these and describe them. Okay, so duration um, has to do with how long the stressful experience lasts. So we have short term, which are called acute uh, acute stressors um, take more of this eustress category. Um, and here what we see is that our responses are very quick, excuse me, and then our recovery is actually pretty quick. So an example of this is if you're driving on the highway and a deer jumps out in front of you, um, you, you know, immediately react, you very quickly assess the situation, you know, where are other cars around you? Can you pull off to the side? Um, and, and sort of assess that very quickly. Um, but after sort of you avoid a collision, you are able to kind of quickly recover. Okay, so I see that a question came in real quick. Let me check and see what this is. Um, the question from Rosalind is, why is the racial ethnic businesses are not receiving financial support comparable to the businesses uh, during the COVID disaster. Um, unfortunately, Rosalind, I'm really not qualified to speak to that. Um, I think that there are probably a lot of, of you know, fundamental reasons why that's happening. Um, what I'm presenting to you is, is the data as it's falling out is, it, you know, what we're seeing is that they just simply weren't awarded the same um, support. So that's probably a, a different question um, for a different talk. And I, I unfortunately am not qualified to really sort of speak to those underly underlying issues. Um, so I know that I didn't really answer your question, um, but you know, you're always welcome to email me and we can have a conversation about that at another time as well. Okay. So um, Long-term stress, on the other hand, um, or repeated stress is called chronic stress. And this definitely takes much more of a distress form. And we see that um, typically what will happen is because uh, stress is either um, repeated or long-term that you have, you have kind of a dysregulated response. So either you don't respond appropriately, you have a delayed response, um, something is sort of lacking in that process. Um, and then your recovery is kind of non-existent. You don't really bounce back in the same way. Um, so an example of this would be if you were sort of stuck in a dead end job, um, you know, or, you know, kind of in a miserable toxic relationship um, that you don't feel like you can necessarily escape from for potentially financial reasons that you can sort of understand and see how that would be long term or chronic or repeated stress. Um, okay, so I got another question, which is what is considered the appropriate way to respond to stress? Um, so that is a, a tricky question, and I don't actually really get into um, sort of effective strategies, um, but I do talk about a, a concept of control, and I'll actually get to that in a second. So um, hopefully I'll be able to sort of uh, address that question a little bit more in um, a couple minutes. Okay. So that is duration. Um, intensity is the next sort of category classifier of sort of how stress impacts us. And what intensity has to deal with is how does that stress actually impact our overall quality of life? And um, there are sort of, I, I like to call them the big three components that are critical for survival. These are things that we need to be high functioning beings. Um, and these are social connection, financial resources, and physical health. And I don't know if you recall, but these are also like pretty much maps on to the indirect effects that we're seeing from COVID. And what we see with COVID is that even in absence of an infection, COVID targets basically each of these big three in pretty substantial fundamental ways. However, we also see that certain groups are experiencing that strain disproportionately. So social connection is really important to us. Um, it, it, when we don't have it, it leads to isolation, which can lead to depression. Um, and it, it's, 
we all know that masks suck, right? Like we all know that it's awful. And, and, you know, I have glasses, so like my glasses get fogged, but really it fundamentally, it, it, it separates us. I mean, I would love to be giving this talk in person. I'm, I'm like, I can't see any of you right now. Um, I'm just looking at my slides talking, right? So it's, I have to imagine that I'm talking to a room full of people when in fact, I'm just talking to a computer screen, right? This is really removes our ability to communicate. And our faces are actually really important for how we communicate and interact with each other. Our brains have a certain uh, region devoted entirely to recognizing individual people based on their facial structure, right? We have unconscious uh, emotions that are, are shown on our faces and, and our facial face-to-face -face communication is, um, you know, the nonverbal communication is just as important as our verbal communication. So masks really are a huge barrier to that. We're also seeing, um, and you know, perhaps not so much now, but we have in this past year, seen a lot of uh, political and social unrest over COVID responses. Um, so I, I mean, I remember hearing stories of, of people like shooting each other in stores because people were either wearing masks or not. Um, and that this has become a very like politically divisive thing. Um, and, <sighs> You know, we can kind of step back and we can say that, you know, certain people are getting hit harder with the stress of this. Um, but again, this is impacting all of us. <clears throat> um, I think there's another question. Hold on just a second. So somebody asked, is the social connection and the need for people to talk to others partially a reason why lockdowns and quarantines got lifted? Um, and it, the, the answer that I have um, for this is that I believe that at least in Michigan, um, when restrictions have been lifted, it has mostly been because of um, uh, infection and death rates being, you know, going down. Um, so it actually seemed like uh, maybe it was safer to do that. Um, I know that uh, our politicians here in Michigan, at least, were were trying not to make those decisions based on um, what people were expressing in terms of uh, their frustration and more based on sort of what the data was suggesting was the most appropriate thing to do. Um, so I don't know if that necessarily answers your question, um, but it I, I actually don't know what ultimately their reasons for lifting or enforcing uh, restrictions are other than to stop the spread um, in as much as possible. Um, okay, so, um, sorry, I'm trying to shift back. Okay, so um, one of the other sort of interesting side effects of this whole political and social unrest that we're seeing over COVID um, is that uh, certain groups who are perhaps not necessarily getting hit as hard with the um, infection and death rights um, might be feeling this in a different way, right? If you're, if you're not necessarily um, experiencing people in your direct family getting sick or dying, um, perhaps uh, there, there might be more skepticism over how bad it's really being reported. Um, and so that, that might sort of lead to some of this political and social unrest that we're seeing, particularly from groups who are maybe not being as um, impacted uh, directly by uh, COVID infection and death rates. What we're also seeing is that our um, care for sick and dying has changed. We have, um, I've heard stories of people having to say goodbye um, over a FaceTime or on a tablet. Um, people aren't able to sit at the bedside of somebody who's dying. Um, it's really changed how we uh, mourn when somebody is dying and really sort of after the fact, mourn um, how we hold our, our funerals and, and you know, reduced ability to sort of get together and, and mourn as a community. So again, this is definitely going to hit certain people harder than others. In terms of the financial impact, um, again, everyone has been impacted by this, but certain people are going to get harder hit harder than others. Um, and particularly low income workers are sort of the first and hardest hit whenever you have any sort of overall economic strain, um, as because they're sort of at the bottom of our economic structure. 
right? So some people are dealing with forced layoffs or just an inability to work. You know, if you're a server in a restaurant and the restaurants are closed, you can't work. Um, they are more likely to have reduced savings to sort of buffer from that temporary income loss. And they're much quicker to then transition into these housing and food insecurity situations, right? But they also have just like less ability to adapt to all of the changes that we have, right? Um, sometimes they have reduced access to technology, um, reduced freedom to isolate and quarantine. I mean, if you have to go to work um, in person at the grocery store to maintain your health insurance, if you have an exposure, you might not be able to stay home and isolate. So um, financial, sort of the financial strain definitely is hitting certain people harder, um, particularly for those low wage um, be, uh, hourly workers. And when I'm talking about financial resources, I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about like all of the other things that money can buy, right? Including technology and transportation and housing and, and all of that. And then the third thing is uh, physical and mental health. And now again, remember that I'm talking about in absence of an infection. Um, so we experienced significant uh, reduction in medical resources from non-COVID needs. I remember uh, sort of joking with our kids that, that they had to be really careful because if anything happened to them, we couldn't take them to the hospital because it was like not a funny joke, right? Because people were dying at the hospital. But it, I mean, that was a, that was a real impact where, um, you know, you, you couldn't go to the ER if you needed to for a little bit there because our hospitals were overrun and entirely focused on COVID. Um, and we're definitely seeing some fatigue and burnout from these frontline and essential workers where, yeah, maybe they're not necessarily experiencing that, that economic pinch because they're continuing to work, but they are definitely experiencing this burnout and trauma of dealing with the, you know, the, the frontline aspect of this day to day. Again, mental health and substance abuse um, rates are higher and just sort of increased risk of exposure for certain people because they have to continue going to work, right? So if you have to go to work and your kids are, are have to stay home and do distance learning, you, you have to make the decision to either have someone come into your home or potentially risk maybe your, your mom or your grandma, right? So there's just like more exposure happening. And we also see that all of this sort of COVID related stress is compounded, right? So the people who are potentially receiving the, the, the most burden here, um, who are you know, low income workers uh, predominantly, are also populations who are, have been suffering sort of the most um, in these sort of generational, historical, economic health disparities. Right. So so black and brown people are sort of overrepresented in these low wage hourly jobs, and they're more likely to not be able to work from home. Right. So imagine how this whole sort of scenario with with your social connection and your financial resources and your physical health and safety might be different um, if you're able to make the choice to work from home or if you have the option to work from home versus someone who can't. Right. So so you see that there's kind of teasing out fundamental reactions that people might be having to the same scenario based on on the their ability to even just something as simple as working from home. And what we see is that with sort of so we have kind of duration on the X axis and intensity on the Y axis and that, you know, with sort of acute or mild stress, it might be more of this U stress scenario. Um, but that, you know, it's we're dealing with COVID for a year now um, and the COVID has sort of targeted the big three. And again, certain people are going to kind of experience this differently, that, that COVID really is sort of pushing us into this distress category. Um, and it's it really is fundamentally trauma, right? Um, but what we're seeing is that there actually is another component that really does change how stress impacts us. And that is control. Um, and control is interesting because it it is it doesn't have to actually be real. You don't actually have to have real control over altering the nature of your stress. Perceived control is enough to do it. Um, so even if you think you have the ability to take action and control what's stressing you, that is enough to really uh, sort of boost your resilience. 
And that what we see that control is actually sort of the biggest factor in predicting sort of uh, how stress impacts you, you know, more of that like you stress versus distress scenario. Um, compared to intensity and duration, control kind of is like the biggest factor. And what we see is that, um, so these rats are sort of yoked together, which means they're they're connected on one um, electrical circuit. So these uh, electrodes are actually kind of um, put on their tails. And if the circuit's turned on, they each receive a little bit of a, a shock. And I mean, it's not enough to cause damage, but it's definitely um, stressful for them. It's definitely painful and they definitely don't like it. Um, but these rats are sort of in one circuit. So if one animal, um, so when the shock comes on, they both are receiving the same intensity and duration of shock. However, one animal has the ability to sort of push a button or push a lever uh, to turn that uh, shock off when it comes on. So the shock comes on, both animals are receiving it, but one rat has the ability to turn it off. That rat has control. Now the shock also turns off for the other rat. However, that rat didn't do anything to make it turn off. It's just passively having the shock turned off for it. And what we see is that stress levels during the actual session really do go down for rats that have control, and you don't see any sort of residual impacts on their health after the fact. Whereas rats that have no control, their stress levels remain very high, and then you see this cor corresponding, you know, huge decrease in their control after the fact. And what we see is that it's kind of interesting is that that um, researchers who study depression will actually use paradigms similar to this to induce um, states of depression by, uh, you know, taking away control in stressful scenarios. And so this really is essentially creating depression in us. Um, and we see with COVID that this is sort of playing out in some interesting ways. Right, we find that wearing a mask or not is actually a form of control, right? So if I go to the store and I put my mask on, that's a, a tangible concrete thing that I can do to protect myself and the people around me. Um, so that is a form of asserting control. Whereas for some people who um, maybe feel that their control has been taken away from them because of you know, imposed regulations from the state or federal level, um, not wearing a mask is a form of them asserting their own control. Now, I'm not saying that that's um, sort of a, 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 a accurate assumption. Um, you know, it, definitely the data suggests that, that masks do um, inhibit the spread of the infection. Um, but what I'm saying is that it's understandable that based on sort of how you're experiencing the stress, that your sort of ability or desire to take control might take different forms. And again, we've sort of talked about this uh, impact of, of having the ability or not having the ability to work from home. So for instance, you need to continue working, but your children can't go to school. Um, if you have the ability to work from home, you can sort of solve that problem, right? You have the ability to sort of manage it. Um, and so that is a very quick and easy way that you have taken control over that stressor. However, if you cannot work from home um, and yet your children need to be home, then that you have no control over that. And that, that sort of perpetuates that stress in your life. <clears throat> Um, so duration and intensity are actually coded by cortisol. So cortisol is our primary stress hormone um, and it's released through a process that starts in our brains in a region called the hypothalamus. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the system is actually called the HPA axis for the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal cortex. So it's kind of a, a cascade signaling that results in the release of cortisol, which is our stress hormone from the adrenal glands. So when cortisol is released um, in sort of normal or acute situations, um, the presence of cortisol rising in our blood actually sort of feed has a negative feedback um, and inhibits further stress being released in our brains from our brains. Right. So this is how we get this sort of quick adaptive uh, responses that we see sort of cortisol helps mediate that. But yet we also get that sort of quick recovery that happens. Whereas um, when you have chronic or intense stress, taking more of this sort of distress 
form, the, uh, the, the results on our body are actually quite disruptive. I mean, you can have uh, long-term implications in terms of how your metabolism works, how your inflammation is regulated and how memory formation works. So lots of sort of long-term effects. Um, and you don't really get that sort of um, feedback loop the, the same way, right? So, so cortisol is not able to sort of shut its own production off in quite the same way. So you just sort of get dysregulated cortisol levels. And what we see with control is that that actually really does truly change how this process works. Um, so we have a region in our prefrontal cortexes, which is sort of right here behind our front, our uh, foreheads, um, that actually recognizes control. So remember, I said that you don't actually have to have control; you just have to think you do. Um, so our brain sort of will will trick us if even if we think we have it um, into actually shutting down this HPA sort of stress hormone response. And so what we see is that while COVID has been sort of pushing some people into more of this distress trauma stage, if you have the ability to assert control in any way over that stress, um, the, the, that drastically improves your outcome. So um, take a look at this picture and um, you know, think to yourself and kind of answer for yourself, what is this woman experiencing? And the, the answers might vary, right? She could have a headache. Maybe she's tired. Maybe she's sick, right? If you, if you think that maybe she's sad and you can kind of see her trying not to cry, like you can kind of see that in her face, right? Maybe she's overwhelmed. Maybe she's stressed, Right? And so I actually really like this picture because it, it illustrates quite clearly that all of those things are kind of the same thing. And what we see with trauma is that it really does change us, right? We have changes in sleep, eating, how we interact um, in terms of our sexual behavior. Um, we have changes in our metabolism. We are usually don't want to interact socially quite as much. Um, a lot of Times people experience lethargy, which is tiredness. Um, you might have increased pain, changes in your mood, um, and brain fog, which is sort of this collection of, of uh, sort of cognitive changes in the way you have reduced ability to think, um, maybe problems with learning and memory. Um, but when we look at this sort of collection of effects that are, are sort of in the literature defined as sort of sickness responses, we actually intuitively know this by uh, something different. This is depression, right? And, and what's really kind of interesting about this sickness response to trauma and depression and sickness in general, like an infection, is that they really are sort of one and the same. Our brains really can't distinguish them. Um, and so it's, it's sort of an interesting thing that we use the word sick to describe you know, the stress of COVID, I'm sick of COVID. Really, you're talking about I'm sick of, you know, I'm frustrated with or tired with all of the things I'm having to deal with, but our brains really do interpret it as sickness. Um, and so because, you know, a, a stress and an infection both have the same sort of end result for us, um, the problem really happens when you are encountering both, right? And so what we see is that when people who are dealing with the COVID-induced trauma also get infected with COVID-19, that there's like a synergistic effect there, right? Like those things are, are, are um, added together and the effects are much more pronounced. So you see more severe symptoms, reduced ability to fight the infection and higher death rates. Okay, so we have another question real quick. Real quick. Um, so this, this question has to do with um, wondering how employers acknowledge the impact on employees um, who are working from home. And I think that that is important, right? Because, we, you know, what I'm kind of setting up is saying, oh, well, you know, if you get to work from home, then, then you're not dealing with the stress of it. But I mean, anyone who has tried to work from home, um, doing the things they need to do and the calls they need to make, yet also sort of trying to navigate and figure out the technology of their kids. I mean, that, it, that that's not a, a you know, sort of relaxed scenario for anyone. Um, so this is actually talking about um, not performing at maximum ability. Um, so this is talking about kind of when, if people are sort of being reprimanded for not uh, 
for not performing well on the job um, and that this is happening particularly for people of color um, or who are dealing with sort of this, you know, um, a side effects of sort of the political um, climate. Um, and I honestly, I am not really able to speak to, to some of that, right? I like, I'm kind of, I'm a scientist and like I, I can talk about um, sort of how these processes work. And like, these are really good questions. And I'm hoping that sort of this conversation is really starting to uh, get us to ask these big questions. Like, how does this, how does this apply in terms of if people can't go to work or aren't performing well? Um, and honestly, I'm not able to give you a better answer and I apologize for that. Um, but keep asking questions even if I can't <laughs> answer them. Um, okay, so what we see is that when people are dealing with trauma and a COVID infection together, they're actually having worse outcomes. And sort of going back to what the CDC was saying in terms of race and ethnicity, race and ethnicity as risk markers for these underlying conditions. The translation here is that black and brown people are more likely to be poor, have reduced access to healthcare, be exposed to the virus, and then also have a pre-existing condition, right? And so what we're seeing is this like COVID-induced trauma directly leads to greater vulnerability to a COVID infection. And I think it's important to also note that this is sort of like in addition to already established higher rates of generational and economic marginaliz marginalization that certain populations have already been experiencing, right? Like this is like the COVID induced trauma is only been for the past year. Um, and so, you know, this is just another thing that sort of added on top of that. What we're seeing is that then this kind of leads us to sort of two obvious questions. Why is this happening and how does this happen? Um, and I, again, I'm not really sort of able to, to speak to the nuances of why this happens. You know, the short answer is this is, this is the byproduct of a history of systemic and institutionalized racism. Um, but my sort of personal um, uh, expertise can speak more to the how. How does this happen? How does our um, body physiologically adapt to stress and how does that change our immune function? And what we see is that stress fundamentally changes sort of this immune system reaction that we have to a, a viral infection. We have this sort of overblown, exaggerated, um, innate immune response and a corresponding decrease in the acquired response. So what we're seeing is that uh, stress sort of increases inflammation. So remember this sort of innate immune system activation is what's sort of uh, what's actually responsible for the symptoms that we experience. Um, and what we see is that severe COVID uh, cases really do present with increased levels of those um, cytokine um, inflammation signals. Um, so that's called the cytokine storm that certain people with severe COVID infections um, are showing. And this is a point where uh, symptoms are no longer adaptive, right? Remember I said that, that you know, some of the symptoms we might experience might be serving us well. This is sort of transitioning into a place where that is, that's not working for us anymore. It's becoming much more damaging. And we're also seeing that sort of the, there's a decrease in that secondary wave of our immune activation where we have a decreased ability to fight the infection and redu reduce sort of long-term resistance to seeing that infection again in the future. So again, the top one is sort of a, a normal response and the bottom is what you're seeing with like a stress or a trauma response. So in a normal response, you know, symptoms are lacking or mild, infections cleared, you have long lasting resistance. However, with stress, you know, you have much more intense symptoms, um, your infection persists for longer and you have reduced long-term uh, resistance to the infection if you ever encounter it again. And what we're seeing with COVID is that this is definitely the case. Um, uh, uh, some people have very severe outcomes. Um, and we're also seeing some uh, sort of weird or atypical cases where people are continuing to be infectious um, for, for weeks and even months after their initial sort of exposure or diagnosis, which isn't um, you know, is indicative that the virus is not being cleared from their symptom, their system. And we're also seeing um, increased mortality for certain groups. 
And we can kind of say that inf infection resistance is almost like a battery, right? It's a finite resource. Um, you, you can't just maintain a full battery if you're using up um, th that with sort of all of the stressors in your life. And we have sort of things that fill our battery, um, being healthy, um, having, you know, a good diet, strong social support and strong finances, right? All of those things sort of fill you up and maintain your immunity to be very strong. Um, whereas things that sort of drain our battery or make us more weak, uh, low quality food, you know, uh, having a, a manual labor job or sort of, you know, more physical stress, um, illness, reduce social support on stable relationships and sort of dealing with financial or housing insecurity. And, you know, honestly, is the way this sort of plays out is that young, healthy and wealthy people are experiencing higher resilience, right? Less likely to be impacted by those day-to-day -day stressors of COVID, reduced exposure to COVID. And if they do get infected, it's not usually as, as bad of an outcome. Whereas sick, elderly, and poor people have very low resistance. Um, they are dealing more with daily COVID struggles. They're more likely to be exposed to COVID. And if they are and they get sick, they're more likely to have very severe or deadly outcomes. And what we see is that predominantly this top sort of case um, is, is happening more statistically for white and wealthy populations. And this sort of bottom scenario is happening more for uh, poor and um, certain racial and ethnic groups, right? And, and we know that um, if you're looking at wealth alone, that there is this huge disparity in terms of who has the money in our in our society. And, um, you know, this is data talking about median net worth of um, a, a, a given family based on their race. And this is actually, this data is actually controlled for current income. So the disparities that you're seeing here are actually related to generational wealth, right? So people who have more money are more likely to have that money passed down from um, other people in their family. And what we're seeing is that there are just absolutely huge disparities in the deaths that we're seeing from COVID. So the, the way to sort of read these graphs, um, this one here on the left is United States total. This one here on the right is for Michigan. Um, and what you see, this is like a, a midline and any of the bars above the midline mean that those people are experiencing um, death at higher rates compared to their population. And people below the midline are experiencing um, less severe outcomes, so fewer deaths compared to population. So what we're seeing is above the midline, um, we have Hispanic and non-Hispanic Black populations. Um, the, these other bars are actually for, for other classifications. And predominantly, the, the uh, the people who are um, being um, disproportionately not um, impacted or, or sort of spared are um, non-Hispanic white populations. And so this is again for the United States. Um, and here you see for Michigan that that really shifts and that, that Black populations, Black folks are definitely bearing the brunt of this here in Michigan. And this is, again, this is COVID, um, but you know, it's not like things just changed a year ago and suddenly things are different for Hispanic and Black folks and, um, and you know, white people, you know, that this is just sort of pulled out. Um, this is evidence of generational um, disparities that we're seeing. And, you know, I think initially when COVID first happened, there was a lot of talk that this was the great equalizer, that everyone could get infected. And so anyone potentially could die. But because of that sort of secondary effect with stress, that this is not, that's not how it's really playing out. Um, certain people are definitely impacted harder. Okay, so 
that leaves us in a very somber note, right? It's easily, it's easy to feel very discouraged by that. Um, and sort of, I don't, I don't want to leave us feeling super discouraged. Um, I recognize that there is a need for sort of systemic change, but right now we're dealing with COVID. So what, what, what path do we have forward for COVID? Um, and the vaccine really is sort of this ray of hope. Um, and hopefully uh, people are sort of experiencing this hope. However, what we're seeing is that while Black and Hispanic folks are more likely to be in fact impacted by daily COVID-related stress, more likely to be exposed to an infected, more likely to be hospitalized and die, they are less likely to get the COVID vaccine. Right? So the people who need it the most are not getting it, um, or vaccines in general. So this is actually data from last um, last flu season showing the uh, flu vaccination rates are much lower um, for Black and Hispanic populations than for white populations. And this sort of transfers into what we're starting to see and measure, um, particularly for the COVID vaccine that has um, is more recent. So this is actually showing um, uh, anticipated vaccination rates. So for people who are, um, are, are saying that they are more or less likely to get the vaccine. Um, and what you see is that, that there is a lot of hesitancy in the Black community on getting the vaccine. Um, they are reporting, um, Black folks are reporting that they are more hesitant uh, to get the COVID vaccine. And so we're seeing that, that particularly for the most vulnerable groups, um, you know, here in Michigan, that's uh, Black folks, their va actual vaccination rates are much lower. Um, so not every state reports vaccination rates by race. So we don't actually have um, data from Michigan. But in the overall um, United States, we're seeing that um, Black folks are getting uh, vaccinated. They're about 6% of uh, the people getting vaccinated, um, whereas they represent about 16% of the population. So definitely um, reduced compared to population. And there are a lot of reasons why um, Black people are uh, historically skeptical of things like vaccines. Um, and, and one of this has to do with just like a history of mistrust of medical system within Black communities. Um, there's a, a long history of use and abuse of black bodies. I mean, think about slavery is, um, you know, huge in terms of um, not having control over uh, your body. Um, and, you know, even recently, the Tuskegee study um, where uh, there's so an awful study called the untreated syphilis in the Negro male. And, and what this study did was they, um, one, they were not forthcoming in terms of what the study was all about. Um, so people did not know what they were getting themselves into. Um, and what ended up happening was 623 men who, who uh, were um, had syphilis and their wives um, were not treated for that syphilitic infection, um, even when penicillin became available. And not only were they not treated, um, but they the researchers actively um, advertised sort of to local doctors not to treat them. So, it, I mean, it, it's completely understandable why people would hear historical accounts of ways that the medical system abused black bodies and be skeptical of things like vaccines. Um, and then on top of that, you also have the, that these groups are have reduced access, right? Reduced insurance, reduced resources locally. I mean, you don't you don't necessarily see a med center um, on the corner, right? Re reduced likelihood to actually have a general practitioner. Um, and reduced time, free time for preventative appointments, right? So, so you are seeing that certain groups are more likely to have those preconceived, or excuse me, um, pre-existing conditions. Okay, now I've got a couple questions coming in, um, so I may not be able to get to all of them. Um, so we have a question talking about how do you think the stress of COVID affects student performance? Um, and you know this definitely plays in, right? Because uh, COVID-induced trauma um, can lead to that, that sort of brain fog, which is a reduced ability to concentrate, a reduced ability for, to, for learning and memory. Um, so that definitely will impact your ability to perform um, at school. Um, <clears throat> another question.
Um, okay, so somebody's asking about um, how the vaccine works with the immune system. So I'm actually going to get into that um, more in a second. So I will answer that question for you, Dixie, in a minute. Um, so another person's asking, could lower vaccination rates also have to do with access? And yes, that is absolutely the case. Um, it seems like frontline workers are first in line. Um, however, the, you're actually seeing higher rates of members of the Black community who are uh, who are frontline workers who are um, denying or declining the vaccine um, because of the sort of historical mistrust. Um, okay, so I hope I answered that question too. Okay, so again, you know, I, I don't want to be so bleak. Um, Michigan actually has sort of this really awesome deep roots with vaccine science. Um, right now we have Pfizer and Kalamazoo is sort of, um, you know, one of the, the key players in the COVID vaccine. And that's something that we really can be proud of here in Michigan. Um, but also Grand Rapids was very instrumental in um, developing and refining the whooping cough or the pertussis vaccine. Um, particularly this woman, uh, Loni Clinton-Gordon, um, this black woman who played a key role in this process, which is really awesome. And, you know, we have sort of uh, a, a really awesome reason to be proud of this here in Grand Rapids. Um, it was actually a, a sort of spearheaded by a three woman team, which is also pretty awesome for the 1940s. And um, Loni Gordon isolated the um, particular uh, most virulent strain of um, pertussis that was then used to manufacture a more um, uh, a more effective vaccine. And we have here is a, um, a statue that was put up um, in front of the MSU Research Center downtown, right? So that's like a pretty awesome, you know, local thing to be proud of. Okay, so how do vaccines work um, in general? And now this is for, this is, you know, not COVID. Um, this is sort of in general um, vaccines, um, really sort of kind of hijack and sort of target the same process that, that we use naturally when we're exposed to a, a, an infectious virus. Um, so when uh, a vaccine injects, um, what it's actually containing is, is sort of little pieces of virus. Um, so not active and infectious, but it actually does contain pieces of virus, particularly for whatever, um, you know, that, that vaccine is for. Um, and then you also will have sort of other random chemicals and components that are included called adjuvants. And those are designed to really sort of irritate and stimulate our immune systems into, um, you know, building that immunity. Um, but then the, the sort of the whole other rest of the response is, is excuse me, the same ending with antibody production that is specific to um, the virus presented in the vaccine. So what we're seeing with COVID and the COVID vaccine is that this process is totally different. Um, so uh, to really understand how the COVID vaccine works, I have to go back and explain a little bit about how our cells actually function. Um, so what we have, again, remember that our cells are sort of like manufacturing facilities and um, in our uh, human nucleus or the, cell, the nucleus of our cells, we have DNA, which is like the master code for all of the genes that code for proteins and all of those proteins make up the function of the cell. So if a particular protein is needed to be produced, uh, the DNA will make a copy into RNA. That RNA will get sort of packaged um, for delivery. So kind of taking a letter and putting it into an envelope and stamping it and addressing it for delivery. Um, and that packaged instructions will then go out to um, a particular uh, part of the cell called the Golgi apparatus, and it's like kind of squiggly like this. And that Golgi apparatus will sort of just take those instructions and manufacture what it's told to manufacture. And then you'll get sort of the desired protein. So COVID really sort of hij hijacks this system, right? So the COVID vaccine only has these sort of packaged mRNA instructions for the spike protein. So remember, the spike protein is actually this little uh, protein on the outside of, of the virus that binds to our ACE2 receptors and sort of gains entry. So no part of the COVID virus is in the vaccine. No DNA is in the vaccine. It's just those packaged instructions. And again, our cells are just like stupid manufacturing machines. And they're like, okay, you're telling us to make this. And they just start manufacturing the, um, the spike proteins. And once they have a lot of them, they're kind of like, I don't really know what to do with this. And so they just 
like put it out onto the cell surface and that initiates the whole innate immune leading to the acquired immune leading to antibody response that we find, right? And so that's how we are actually able to sort of generate an antibody response specific for COVID, um, even if the, the vaccine does not contain any COVID whatsoever, which is pretty cool. Um, I do want to add a little thing in here about these new COVID variants that have sort of been in the news and explain a little bit about what that is. Um, so viruses evolve through mutation all the time. I mean, for instance, we get, uh, you know, new flu vaccines every year because they're just new flu uh, viral strains every year um, because it's just a naturally evolving process. And with these COVID variants, um, the mutations appear to be on the spike protein in particular. Um, and the, the, the new variants, particularly ones that, that are seeming to be more infectious, um, actually make those spike proteins a better fit for our ACE2 receptors. Um, and so that might be what's causing them to be a little bit more infectious. Um, but the, the preliminary data we have on the vaccines indicates that um, these COVID vaccines are still very much protecting against these new variants. Um, and even if it's sort of not a, a perfect protection, even if it's like an 80% um, protection, and I'm just pulling that um, out of the air, uh, that it's still 80% better than nothing, right? So, so even if it's not a perfect fit, it's definitely still a better fit um, for these new variants. So, um, you know, continue to get vaccinated if and when you're able. Um, and so this is sort of like a common vaccine myths. Um, and one of the main ones I think is going around is that the vaccine will give you uh, a COVID-19 infection. Um, and remember that, uh, that a lot of times people think that they're getting sick from vaccines because they feel uh, sick after they're having symptoms after. And what we're really seeing is that that is your immune system, right? So there is no um, infectious agent in the vaccines. You're not getting an infection. Um, but if you are having an immune response, it's actually a really great sign that the vaccine is working. Um, and so people usually interpret having reactions Reactions as, a, as a negative, but again, those symptoms are actually pretty adaptive. This is a great sign that the vaccine's working. Um, the vaccine obviously will not change your DNA. We actually don't have the ability to transfer RNA back into DNA, so our cells don't possess the ability to do that. Um, another common myth is that people, uh, if you have had a COVID-19 infection, um, think, well, I don't, I don't need to get vaccinated because I've already had it. However, current sort of evidence is suggesting that um, a, a COVID-19 infection might only give you about three months of resistance. Um, and so it, you might, you might, it's still advised to get vaccinated um, potentially early on right now when vaccine supply is pretty limited. Maybe you don't need to rush into that. Um, but there's some evidence to suggest that if you have had a COVID, vac uh, COVID infection prior, that that sort of serves as your first dose, and you may only need one additional dose. Um, another myth that's sort of not on here that I think is um, another common one is that people say, um, well, if I get vaccinated, I don't need to wear a mask. Um, and what we're seeing is that sort of the, the vaccine sort of sets you up to easily fight an, an infection if you have it later on. Um, but it doesn't necessarily prevent you from getting an infection and it may not prevent you from also being um, contagious to other people. Um, we do know that the vaccine definitely is, is reducing rates of very severe illness um, and lowered rates of death. Um, so that's really awesome, but, but it doesn't necessarily mean that um, like it, you get the all clear. Um, and in general, we, we really need to sort of maintain our vigilance with masks and social distancing until we have reached a general level of herd immunity to prevent, um, you know, widespread infection spreading. Okay, so sort of effective strategies moving forward, um, when you can get vaccinated, so take control, get yourself on the list, and the next slide I'll actually um, give you the, the uh, contact information to pursue that um, if you want. Um, we know that based on sort of the way our stress resilience works, that sort of battery that goes up and down, that there, that actually does fluctuate pretty quickly. So if you can avoid stress as much as possible for even 24 hours before getting the vaccine can sort of help build your, your natural resilience and immunity. Um, so, you know, get a lot of sleep, eat a good diet, maybe go for a walk, um, and in general, really sort of encourage friends and family to get vaccinated. Um, a, a lot of 
a lot of what we need right now is word of mouth sort of encouragement. Um, and, and the nice thing about encouraging your, your family in particular to get vaccinated is not only will it help protect them, but it will help protect you as well if you can create a little uh, vaccination bubble around you. Um, and, you know, in general, the vaccine is not our only source of control. So continue to wear masks, avoid large gatherings and follow guidelines as much as possible still. Um, all of that is, is still really helpful and important. Okay, so um, this is my last slide. Um, I will take questions, but I do want to kind of leave this up here uh, so you have it if you need it. You can, um, even if you're, you're not sort of in the category to get vaccinated yet, you can get on the list and get registered. You can go to vaccinatewestmichigan.com or go to michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. Um, and then another reason that certain people are, are not getting vaccinated at, at as high rates is, is access, right? So you don't actually need to use a website or a computer to do that. You can call directly the COVID hotline, and this is the number, um, or you can call the Kent County First Call for Help, which is a, a free sort of hotline to connect community members with resources, and that's 211. Um, so these are great ways to uh, get yourself on the list. Um, okay, so I have a couple questions here. Um, okay, so I do want to go back to the one question that asked about, um, an, okay, so the question is, do you have an opinion regarding the impact of the vaccine on the immune system, especially if there is a pre-existing condition that may be in remission? So, um, you know, the one of the concerns I think people have when they have uh, a pre-existing condition is that I won't I won't be able to overcome the infection. And the nice thing about the vaccine is that it's not injecting any sort of infection, right? So the worst that would happen is that maybe you are not able to mount as much of an immune response. Um, you know, maybe your antibody load is lower because your immune system is um, maybe uh, a little bit, you know, lower in terms of how well it's functioning. But but you won't, you're not going to be getting an infection from the vaccine. And so you, you're not running the risk of like potentially having such severe side effects or, or leading to death, right? Because you won't be triggering an immune response in the same way you would with an infect, an actual infection. Um, okay, so some other questions. Will the vaccine need to be administered every year or is it a one-time vaccine? Um, that's a really great question. We don't know. Um, right now, they're, they're actually, uh, it's like a two-part series. So you you go and depending on which vaccine, you either get it like three or four weeks later. Um, um, and I, you know, honestly, based on how the flu vaccine works, I wouldn't be surprised if we had like a, a yearly booster update, that sort of thing. Um, okay, so... Somebody asked, why is it that Hispanics and Blacks aren't being afforded the opportunity to get the vaccine as much as whites? And honestly, I think that a lot of this has to do with access. Um, nobody is, is necessarily reaching out. Um, so, you know, we have like hospital systems that are, are reaching out to their employees. Um, but for community members who are not employed by a hospital system, nobody is necessarily reaching out to them and saying, hey, you qualify, come do this. So that's one of the reasons why we we need to have talks like this and, and really spread this information world, word of mouth um, so that we are uh, you, you know, getting people to be motivated to register themselves or to help register your family members um, and get involved in the process because nobody is sort of jumping that process for us. Um, okay, so I think that I, let me double check real quick that I have um, answered all of the questions. Please continue asking questions. We have, um, you know, 12 more minutes and I'm happy to um, continue answering questions. Um, if you are, if you are done with the talk, you're welcome to leave. I do appreciate you all coming, um, but I will stick around as long as there are questions. Again, it's really hard for me to see because I can't like see people raising their hands. Um, <clears throat> So somebody is asking, I have had many friends who have developed high fever and flu type symptoms from the injection, so it must be affecting some immune function. Yes, that is true. I, the, the vaccine is triggering the same immune response, right? But it's not, it's not triggering that response in 
um, in response to an actual infection, it's triggering the response to the presence of those spike proteins that our cells manufacture, right? So, so you're, you're not potentially going to see sort of those negative consequences that you would see when an infection continues and sort of spirals out of control. Um, somebody's asking about uh, Dr. Sherry Ten Pennies stance on the COVID vaccines. I don't know anything about her. Um, Dixie, if you would like to email me directly, I would love to have a conversation with you about this. Um, and I can, well, my, my uh, email is juliacary at grcc.edu. <clears throat> Does the vaccine, um, is the vaccine free? Is from, from what I know, yes, it is, um, including um, all of our uh, vaccine tests are also free. So if you um, have been exposed and you want to get a test, you also can get those for free. Um, you do not have to pay for any vaccine or excuse me, any COVID related treatment right now. Um, so e even if you become hospitalized, so sick that you, you become hospitalized, you should not have to pay for any COVID related treatment. Um, I do not have the contact information for Ottawa and Allegan counties, um, but Vaccine West Michigan should be able to link you to all of the local counties. Um, and this COVID hotline, I believe, is a Michigan-based, right? So this Kent County uh, first call for help is specific for Kent County, but the COVID hotline is a Michigan-based hotline. So, so again, you should be able to access um, all community resources or all county resources that way. Um, and the uh, last question that I see here is, uh, where can I find the video to watch later? I don't know yet. We are recording this session. Um, so uh, we will post uh, this information. Um, I, you'll probably be able to find a link to it on the uh, GRCC's psychology department webpage. Um, but I don't actually know where you can find this recording for later. Yeah, actually, um, if, if you look at our YouTube channel, which is just grcc.tv. Okay. You'll be able to, to find it there. grcc.tv. Okay, great. Um, another question. Um, somebody is asking, was it true that when there was a large surge in COVID-19 worldwide that people with pre-existing conditions were turned away for treatment? I do not know about this. Um, that again is not my area of, of personal expertise. I do know that there were reports where some people were, um, you know, not getting on ventilators um, or that sort of sort of thing because there just wasn't enough to go around. Um, and so I think that at, there are cases where hospital systems were sort of trying to prioritize those critical machines for people who were more likely to maybe recover than not. Um, but again, I, Lisa, I do not know the answer to that question. Um, and my last question appears to be from Kate, which just says, great job. So um, if there are any more questions, um, uh, I really appreciate you coming. If you are one of my students, please uh, email me and uh, let me know your thoughts to re receive some extra credit. And um, I will stop sharing my screen now. Oh, wait, is there? Okay. Okay. So that, that's all I have for you. Thank you for attending. Um, and um, uh, we will post the recording of this on GRCC TV, grcc.tv. Um, and our uh, psychology department will probably post a link to it as well.